Assalamu alaikum. In the name of Allah, the Beneficent, the Merciful, I bear witness there is no God but Allah who came to us in the person of Master Farad Muhammad. I bear witness that the most honorable Elijah Muhammad is indeed the and exalted Christ. I furthermore indeed bear witness that the honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan is the national representative of the most honorable Elijah Muhammad, the Messiah today. I greet you all in the nation greeting words of peace. We say it in the Arabic language, Assalamu Alaikum. All praises are due to Allah. On behalf of Brother Albert Muhammad and the Let Us Make Man family, as always family, we continuously thank you for your support. We thank you for taking a few moments of your time to watch the videos, read our posts, support our cause, our efforts in the plight of the black community. We can never thank you enough. We want to take a few moments of your time with this particular subject, and it will be a part two because this particular subject will detail very important information. But we're talking 56 years later after the dream of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. We thank Almighty God Allah for raising such a beautiful brother in Dr. Martin Luther King. Um, before I get started, I want to say this to the believers. Hard trials are necessary to establish truth. And we will indeed be tried and tested on what we say we believe. Remember that. 56 years later, join us as we go into this. The history of Dr. King is well written from birth. Excuse me. So what I want to really get at in this particular session is where we are at today. 56 years later. And under, to understand where we are at, we have to go back. And some of the information that I'm going to share, you may not have time to sit here and listen to the whole thing, but you can always come back. Right? Born in 1929 in Atlanta, Georgia, Dr. King was heavily influenced by his father. Like the most honorable Elijah Muhammad, who was influenced by his father, a church pastor, who Dr. King saw stand up to segregation in his daily life in 1936. Dr. King's father also led a march of several hundred African Americans to Atlanta's City Hall to protest voting rights and discrimination. Now this is Dr. Martin Luther King's father at work in 1936. So this young man grew up with this spirit implemented in his soul, just on the strength of his father, like the most honorable Elijah Muhammad, whose father was also a Baptist preacher. Dr. King said injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. And we know through painful experiences that freedom is never voluntarily given by the oppressor. It must be de demanded by the oppressed. So, say if Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. So, to start this with a little basic history with Dr. King, who grew up under his father, this child was didn't come into the world asking for what Almighty God, Allah, Jesus, Moses, Jah put on this man. The sacrifice that Dr. King made in believing that the power of unity, you talking about in the early 50s and 60s, because we're going to go back. So you can either hang in there with us or you could come back. Here it is, we in 2024. Who are we to blame? 
Is it the white man? Are we still pulling that card? Of course, they are the hidden hand in so many events that take place in the black community. But it, advanced technology is at our dispense today, more so than it was when Dr. King began his journey. We all have a journey to walk. Many of us may be on our journey. Many of us may be embarking on our journey. One of the, I've been listening to Dr. King before I decided to do this video for the last three to four days. When I say listening, I mean playing one or two videos back to back, just absorbing and, and sucking in that man's spirit. Not so much as what he was saying. Of course, I'm listening to everything that he's saying. But the spirit that he put in, what he shared. And remember, this man left a wife and four children behind for the love of black people. He marched in Memphis, Tennessee, supporting the black sanitation workers as they were striking back then, right? There were unity among black men and women in Memphis, Tennessee. And one of the main things Dr. King was expressing was that we stay unified. As you saw at that march in Memphis, Tennessee, right? Supporting the black sanitation workers. Now, if you go back to then and come up to date and go to Memphis, Tennessee today, what will you find among black people? You make the call. I'm not even going to say it. But we're far-fetched from reality when it comes to that type of unity that existed then. We are so disunified today among black people. We despise and reject each other. We got so many different splendor groups in black America. This group against that group. This group can't sit with that group. We're so disunified. And we want to play the religious card as if religion is the issue when we're the most religious people on the planet, black America particularly. We're the most traditional people on the planet. They gave us the, at first, we had the land. We had the land. They came and gave us the Bible, according to the versions that you may have, and they took the land. So now we are stuck with the Bible, which they don't believe in. They never did. I'm talking about the oppressors that Dr. King was speaking on. See? See? There's a lot of things that was happening with Dr. King that was never spoke about. We want to talk about his real assassination real briefly so that we can understand. When the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan said that we couldn't fathom how wicked these people really are, the oppressors, the shot that he took, at that hotel didn't kill Dr. King. Everybody know that, right? Those that was in the operating room that was actually trying to save the man was forced out of the operating room by doctors and members of the FBI. This is documented information. And they suffocated the brother, right? 
I mean, what could we really do about that particular issue? Nothing. And they know that. Because they know that we are such emotional people. And we ride on emotions. As soon as something happens, we get emotionally hyped up, turned up, whatsoever. Right? Dr. King, there is nothing greater in the world than freedom. It's worth, listen to this. Now listen to what Dr. King was saying. This was doing... The March on Washington, August the 28th, 1963, Dr. King said, there is nothing greater in all the world than freedom. It's worth going to jail for. It's worth losing a job for. It's worth dying for. So my friends, this is Dr. King speaking to those that was at this lecture or this talk he gave he said so my friends go out this evening instructions determined to achieve this freedom which God wants for all of his children what was Dr. King saying were they really listening did they really have the heart to 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 um, follow the instructions. It's nothing greater than freedom. Freedom is worth dying for. How many of us is, do really want to die? How many of us really, how many of those that was with Dr. King really wanted to die? There was a, quite a few, don't misunderstand me. But the majority wasn't ready for all of that. Let me read this again. Dr. King said, there is nothing greater in all the world than freedom. It's worth going to jail. Some of us couldn't stay in jail for a hot minute today, let alone months, days. He said, it's worth losing a job. Some of us, if we lose a job today, we lose our damn mind immediately. We just think everything goes downhill because we lost the job. Some of us, it's worth, Dr. King said, it's worth dying for. Then he gave the instructions. He said, my friends, go out this evening. Determined to achieve freedom, which God wants for all his children. But who is God? See, do black people really know who God is? See? God came in the person of Master Farad Muhammad in 1930, but black America didn't accept that. Only 5% of black America was willing to listen and study it. 10% of black America was misled and used and abused by black Americans. Then 85% of black America is still wandering in the dark moving like savages in the pursuit of happiness. How can I say this? Look at the state of black America today. You can't even go out your door. You can barely even speak to your neighbor. People are fighting children, grown-ups fighting children among black people. You say support black, buy black, blah, 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 blah. But you go into a black establishment, they treat you like you a damn criminal, ready to shoot you. This is our reality, family. I know you're not going to like this. I'm not saying it for you to like. There's a reality that we have, reality we must face. We talking 56 years after the I Had a Dream speech, right? Martin Luther King said, in a sense, we've come to our nation. Listen now, this is what got Dr. King killed. He was all right when he was trialing and just, you know, rah, 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 we shall overcome, that kind of stuff. That was fine for the moment. This here is what got Dr. King killed. Listen to what Dr. King said. He said, this is on the March, August 28th, 1963. 
Dr. King said, in a sense, we've come to our nation's capital to cash a check. When the architects of our republic wrote that magnificent words or the, mo the magnificent words of the Constitution and Declaration of Independence, they were signing a promissory note to which every American was to fall here or heir, right? That promissory note that every American should fall here, heir to, right? So Dr. King said that um, this note was a promise that all men, yes, black men as well as white men, would be guaranteed the unalienable rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. America has given the Negro people a bad check. And you talking about what they just sent to Palestine? Y'all fell in love with Joe Biden and all them? They sent over a hundred million dollars just recently to Palestine to help the Palestinian people. They are my brothers and my sisters. I'm not angry over that. Really doesn't really matter to me. But again, Dr. King said, America has given the Negro people a bad check, a check which has come back marked insufficient funds, right? Dr. King said, pardon me, we are now living, we are now in the year of their Lord, 2024. What have we accomplished? That statement, Dr. King, said, gave, was the mark of death for Dr. King. See, this government knows that she could not afford to pay black people what they owe black people, the generations of black people. So they devised plans and systems. They cut up systems, cut out systems, and we buy into it to keep us calm and under control. This man, Dr. King, you know, as a kid, I, you know, I never thought in my wildest dreams that I would be sitting here having these kinds of conversations because I, I didn't understand nothing about racism or bigotry or none of that stuff, right? I was just a kid coming up in the 60s 70s, 80s, 90s, etc. But the older you get, inshallah, the will of God, the wiser you get. In 1963, pardon me, we want to talk about this here. The Civil Rights Act of 1964. Right. I wasn't even here at that time when this was put in motion in 1964. Editors note, the following is the text of title number seven of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 public publications, L88-352, title number seven as amended as it appears in volume 42 of the United States Code beginning at section 2000E. Title number seven prohibits employment discrimination based on race, color, religion, sex, and national origin. See, how did they come at, how did they come behind that? So they wrote this up to quiet our people down at that time. The Civil Rights Act of 1991, Publication 1-102-166 CRA, color CRA, and the Lilly Ledbetter Fair Pay Act of 2009. Now, mind you, all of this deals with employment, right? 
amended su several sections of Title Number Seven. In addition, Section One Hundred Two of CRA, which is printed elsewhere in this publication, amends the revised statutes by adding new sections following Section Nineteen Seventy Seven, Forty Two U.S.C. U.S. C. Nineteen Eighty One, to provide for the recovery of commissarity and punitive damages in cases of international violation, part of the intentional violations of Title Number Seven, the Americans with Disabilities Act of 1990 and Section 501 of the Rehabilitation Act of 1973, cross-reference to Title Number Seven as enacted, appear in italic following each section heading editor's notes also appears in italics. Beautiful language. Language that they know 80% of our people will not pay attention to. Now, mind you, this act was supposed to provide all Americans with equal employment opportunities, right? How did they come behind that? Well, 29 states in the United States of America got put in law or put in place a law called at will. At will. States. What does that mean? Well, that means that your company or corporation can terminate your employment at will and not be held accountable. I did a research two weeks ago. I talked to a lawyer, right? Now, mind you, this is why we are not to trust the lawyers under any circumstances. This is why we have to raise our people up right. It ain't about religion, man. It's okay to have some religious, some spirituality, some, you know, it's okay. But you're not dealing with religious people. You need to know that. We need to know that. Not you. We collectively need to know that. You're not dealing with religious people. There's nothing religious about the oppressors. Please believe me when I tell you. They don't go to church the same way. They don't pray the same way. And they don't do the things that we do. They just doesn't. They're not traditional people like that. That's the bottom line. You could take it and let it know. I'm just your little brother. I, who am I for you to listen to? Right? 29 states enacted a law called at will, which means they can terminate your employment without any repercussions at all. And you won't find a lawyer that will fight for you because the lawyer already knows there is no win. It's law. So that law just countered what we call the Great Civil Rights Act of 1964. They established what they call the EEOC, Equal Employment Opportunity Commission. Huh? Yeah. These are some of the things, we're going to go a little deeper. These are some of the things that was put in motion during the time when Dr. King and his uh, conglomerati was putting pressure on the Kennedy family, President John F. Kennedy. To respond to the attacks that blacks were suffering as they were marching in peace. Right? You have this Civil Rights Act. What does it mean? It doesn't mean nothing. It's beautiful language. And I read it the way they wrote it to the best of my business ability. More to this, an act to enforce the constitutional right to vote. To counter jurisdiction upon the district courts of the United States to provide inju inju injunctions, relief against discrimination in public accommodations, to authorize the Attorney General to institute suits to protect constitutional rights in public facilities and public educations, to extend commission on civil rights, to prevent discrimination in federally assisted programs, to establish a commission on equal employment opportunity EEOC and for the up and for other purposes be it enacted by the Senate and House of Representatives of the United States of America in Congress assembled 
that this act may be cited as the Civil Rights Act of 1964. Yeah, I know. This ain't the kind of stuff you want to hear. This ain't the kind of stuff you want to talk about. I get it. I'm not here to talk about the stuff you want to talk about. Right? Just think about this. The act to enforce constitutional right to vote. How did they come behind that? At one time, you can during voting season, so to speak, you can go to almost any poll in America and just go and cast your vote. To control the votes and to control who gets office, they implemented more amendments and stipulations on how, when, and where you can vote. This these are the acts of the oppressors and master deceivers. Wow. Section 2000E, Section 701, Definition A. The term person includes one or more individual individuals, governments, governmental agencies, political subdivisions, labor unions, partnership associations, corporations, legal representatives, mutual companies, joint stock companies, trusts, unincorporated organizations, trustees, trustees in case under title 11, originally bankrupt or receivers. You see what they, you see how they came behind the act that was supposed to have been put in place to satisfy the SCLC, the Southern Christian Leadership um, com, um, Committee by Dr. King now. So they put these things in motion that were supposed to quiet our people down. And so we think that we have the right to vote. It's voting season, I'm going to cast my vote. Now, you have to go with all sorts of ID and then they put it on our immigration brothers and sisters to justify it. Do you know that they let a great percent of our brothers and sisters in so they can play mind games with those of us who are already here? To control the voting atmosphere, they set up voting polls now, totally different, psychologically oppressive, because if they can oppress you, then it, it, it would discourage you from even wanting to even get involved, right? The unemployment agencies in Ohio, I'll just speak to the ones in Ohio, because I'm in Ohio. You don't have a clue of what they put people through just to get some sort of communications. One brother told me he called the unemployment office here in Ohio. They told him his whole time would be over 200 minutes. But the EEOC, the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission was established through this so-called bill of rights or civil rights bill that was put in motion by the so-called House of Congress, the, Sem the Senate, and the House of Representatives. Be it enacted by the Senate and House of Representatives. I'm going somewhere with this, but I got to do this. Because in reality, we are at war. And black people, we're really losing. We really, we're seeing phantom hit the planet day after day, night after night. We are not prepared. We in Ohio, if we got the right blizzard that would shut this state down, those of our people in the ghettos of America will not survive. We're not listening to the Messiah present, the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan, who is piping and continuously warning our people to prepare ourselves 
for the days, the dark days that's coming. Right? Dr. King, in this Civil Rights Act, these things that was implemented was counter by our open enemies. To throw Dr. King them off and make them think that they can go back to the Negro and say to the Negro, this is what we have gotten from the Kennedys. See, Dr. King gave his life, but he wasn't the only one. I never really, as a young kid, didn't understand that type of thing. I'm just too young. But now it breaks my heart when I think about Dr. King and people like Malcolm X, Denmark V.C., Sojourner Truth, Gabriel Prosser, Nat Turner, the nanny of the, Marine, the Maroons in Jamaica, Marcus Garvey, the Most Honorable Elijah Muhammad, and the list goes on and on. Frederick Douglass. If I'm forgetting your favorites, I apologize. But the list goes on and on and on. How many people were, how many uh, messiahs or messengers need to be raised amongst black people? Look at the state of black America today. Dr. King and all the people that I mentioned has to be turning over in their graves today. We have sold our souls for the love of our enemies. In our lessons, there's a question, why does he likes the devil, meaning our people? Why do we like our open oppressors so much? Because the devil gives us nothing. He gives us nothing. You think you got something because you have homes a nice home, maybe a nice car, nice job, etc. You sitting on that plant, thinking in your mind that you literally have something. He gives us nothing. What we think we got is crumbs from his table. As you can see, and we're doing it to ourselves, our so-called elite are being taken down one by one. They're showing you that your so-called millions and billions and trillions of dollars that you say you have carry no weight. Dr. King's vision was so powerful that they knew they could not allow this man to continue his efforts. You heard him say, we come to get our check. The European peasants that came over here and the land that these, uh, the open enemies and oppressors took from our brothers, the Indians, the brown, they gave it to the European peasants for free and supported them for over a number of years till they were able to stand up on their own. But the Negro in America has gotten nothing at all. And you're talking 56 years later. There's a reason for that. And we have to accept accountability. We can't look at the young people today and shame and damn them. They're moving out based on our failure, period. They're moving out 99% based on emotion and the so-called um, lie that our oppressor continuous, continuously give our youth. Let's go on. There's another part of this I want to I wanna touch base on and now as we spoke about Dr. King, uh, the civil rights bill, and the trickery that our open enemy implemented in that bill, all the so-called changes that were supposed to make it more safe 
for our people to sit in the same bathrooms, same dining rooms. Dr. King even admitted one of the greatest mistakes he made was he believed that he was integrating our people into a melting pot. Do you have any idea, or do we have any idea how much more successful black people really were when we were separated and segregated? When we were separated and segregated, we, and see, this is the thing about our open enemy. And you can see it every day, right? When we were separated and segregated, we were much more successful than the so-called white peasants, the poor white trash, if that's, what, if that's the language you, I don't like using language like that. So I would just say the white peasants. And because of our success, envy sat in the heart of these particular people and they sought to destroy everything black people created and built during segregation and separation. We had our own schools. Our children were thriving. We had our own supermarkets. We got the best of foods from each other's farms. We were raising our own food. And so we were separated. We couldn't go to the McDonald's or whatever the world they had going on. We had our own mom and pop shops. We had our own restaurants where you get good old soul food. You know where that phrase come from? Soul food. Ain't nothing like some good old soul food. Depending on what you is eating. At that time, we all ate it. Ain't no need to sit up here and play self-righteous unless you just grew up in a household where, where there were only Muslims there and you didn't have to worry about that. And so um, you, you basically um, had to just deal with the, the soul food that, um, excuse me, that was, that was present. And so in our, in, in our people, We, we have to accept our reality and understand what we are really up against, family. And, and I think our biggest problem in that is because we just refuse to accept ourselves and do for selves. The stats and statistics, bear with me for a second, as I pull some very interesting um, information from among our people. Something that we want to um, take into deep consideration when we look at the violence um, in black America. Black on black murder rate in 1964. We want to we want to we want to talk to that. There's a, um, um, a, 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 a status that we, we want to look at and understand what our people really was dealing with and compare it to 2024. We can continue. 50 years of homicide data shows the weight lands on black people. Now, this is their reports. This came out in December 22, December the 22nd, 2023. I read, a new report shows that black men have had the highest homicide victim rate since 1960. Right? A new report on homicide trends in the U.S. reveals that ebbs and flows of killings in America since the 1960s, but the most consistent part is the impact such deaths have had on the black community. Listen good, right? Unless we can face this reality, 
Because the killing today, you're going to find out, is far more higher and more rapid than it was in the 60s. And this is black on black murder. We can't just justify it. We have to deal with it. But to deal with it, we have to understand the root. It says the Council on C Criminal Justice, a nonpartisan think tank, recently released the Trends in Homicide Report, which closely analyzes data on homicides from multiple sources over the past 50 years. The analyst shows that black men have had the highest rate of homicide victimizations since the 1960s. That year, the homicide rate for black men was 42 per 100,000 peoples. By 1970, it was 78 per 100,000. So now look, if in 1960, the victimization rate was 42 per 100,000. Then by the 1970s, it went to 78 per 100,000, which means we have been suffering this cancer of hatred for one another for far too long. And nowadays, it's shoot on sight. Kill on sight. Everybody riding around with a, a firearm and anxious to shoot somebody with it. Unfortunately, it's black on black. Most people don't like to hear this comment. Well, brother, you know, black people ain't I'm not talking about nobody else right now. We're talking about our own people, man. We have to fess up. We cannot continue to leave our future generations with the same cancer that we were left with. From 1980 to 1999, the rate hovered around 54 per 100 people before declining from 2000 to 2019 to around 35 per 100,000. In 2021, the number went back up to 54 point. To put it in perspective, the homicide rate for white males has never gone above 8. Point four per 100,000 since 1960, according to the study. Now, can I say that these are factual? Is up for research. Fact finders who like to do stuff like that. But there's a reality because we have a serious issue with the murder rate in our community. Students from Launch Carter School in New York, March as they wore orange for National Gun Violence Awareness Day on June the 2nd in Crown Heights, Brooklyn. That was a photo they added to this. Where the students, young people, black people were appealing for the gun violence to stop. Most homicides are going to be interracial, which racial groups within racial groups, but black individual, individuals dispro disproportionately make up a large share of homicide victim, victims. Ernest, Ernesto Lopez, Ernest Lopez, who co-authored the study told the gyro that disparity has always been there and there's a whole bunch of research that tries to explain why. Let's keep going. This is where it gets interesting. Since 2020, more than three quarters of all homicides have been committed with a firearm. From 1980 to 1990, guns were used in just two thirds of reported homicides. The clearance rate for homicides has gradually decreased since the 1960s, and in 1964, over 83 percent of homicides was cleared by authorities, and 2022, around 50 percent was. So in 1960 and 64, 
there was a drop in the homicide rate. But in 2022, it went back up. It dropped to 83%. The clearance rates for homicides has gradually decreased since the 1960s. In 1964, over 83% of homicides was cleared by authorities. In 2022, around 50% were. Right? So around 50% were cleared in 2022. So now when you think about the stats and statistics that we're sharing, right? This speaks volumes to where are we? The study also shows how homicides were on a long-term decline from the early 1990s until 2015 when they increased again. Then came the 30% spike in homicides from 2019 to 2020, which was the largest single year increased on record. Over the last several years, crime researchers and academics have explored what drove that increase and point to several factors, such as the disruption caused by COVID-19 pandemic, lie, and the unrest that followed George Floyd's murder, lie, they also believe an increase in gun sales and lack of proactive and effective policing were contributing factors. Facts. Facts. See? If you... See, this is why we have to understand how open in it. As I said in one of the previous videos, there's no gun manufacturers in the black community. There's no um, artillery or ammunition manufacturers in the black community. We don't make the guns. We don't make the bullets. But we seem to have them flooded in our community rapidly. When I was young, we didn't ever even see a gun. I never really saw a real gun until I was in the South. I saw a shotgun grandma had, but we knew not to go nowhere near that. We just knew better. Not today. See, the day these young people have gotten a hold to these weapons because they were poured in our community by our oppressors. In 1995, the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan and the Nation of Islam kicked off the Million Man March. Over two million black men showed up. There was no way our oppressors was gonna allow the influence of the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan and the many speakers that spoke at the Million Man March weigh heavily on the young black male in America. They were calling for unity they were calling for ownership. They were calling for so many positive things. You would have just had to be there. The same movement Dr. King initiated in 1963, when Dr. King initiated the march that he initiated, calling for almost the same exact thing, that our people unite under one umbrella, freedom, Justice and equality. Did Dr. King die for nothing? Did Malcolm die for nothing? Malcolm wanted human rights. And that was worse than the civil rights because the civil rights made it a local inbound issue within the United States. But when Malcolm spoke on human rights, that made it an international movement which at this point, the, um, the so-called uh, world, um, world leaders had to respond to the call of Malcolm X for human rights. So civil rights was an issue locally, which means it stayed in the boundary of the United States government. But the human rights issue was something 
that included the entire world and the so-called um, leaders that's in um, DC, that's in DC or New York, wherever they at. Right? I can't think of what I want to what I want to say relevant to that that body, that August body of of government. Um, and so what what we what we are looking at is a lack of love for self and unity among self. Once we are able to establish the level of self hatred and address it, then we can go back and visit the civil rights movement, the human rights movement, the teachings of the Most Honorable Elijah Muhammad and the various different teachings that, that's available to us to unite our people under one umbrella of freedom, justice, and equality. There's no way that the level of crime in the black community could be so high and nothing is done. And the prison pipeline is flowing with our young people, 12, 13, 13, 14, with life sentences, life. In California, three strike laws. Do you know why that enemy put that in place? I, from my understanding, it was Bill Clinton. It really don't matter who did it. But it was all to continue to oppress the brown, the, the black, brown, and yellow. Black, Spanish, Indian, and Orientals. Because white people really don't, they're, they're, they're far more of them in this country than it is of us. But they don't suffer the way we do. That's just a fact. It's got nothing to do with racism or bigotry. Look at the stats and the statistics and you will see for yourself. In their communities, they don't suffer the stuff that our community suffers. A lot of it is because we are not proactive in our communities. We're not involved. We go and vote people in office because we let Negroes come in the community talking about what they can do for us at the Board of Education. How in the hell can you do something for us at the Board of Education when you're dealing with a body that is set up to suppress our people? Do you think they're going to let some so-called intelligent Negro come in and change their system? I beg your pardon? If you continue to believe that, so every time some Negro come out, vote for so-and-so. Johnny's been born and raised in the city, yada, yada, yada. He's got, and he, Johnny gets in, he doesn't do a damn thing. He can't do anything. There's a body that he has to work with. And they have to make decision feasible for the entire city, not for the Negro section. So we're constantly gullible with the so-called vote black, put this one in, that one in. It shouldn't matter what color they is, as long as they stand for freedom, justice, and equality. That's the most important thing. And we get trapped off in color. Clarence Thomas been in the Supreme Court for God knows how long. What justice have we got from that? The only justice that we will receive is the justice that we go out and fight for. Like Dr. King said, be willing to die for, be willing to go to jail for, be willing to lose your job for if you want justice. So teaches the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. Or we'll just continue generation after generation remembering the dream and acting like the lies never exist. And every year celebrating the birthday and I'm going to end this with this notice that every so-called holiday that is um, granted to some sort of black leader they killed them Malcolm wouldn't be celebrating no holiday if Malcolm was here today they killed Malcolm so to keep us calm they gave Malcolm a stamp they killed Dr. King to keep us calm. They gave him stamps, street signs, like Malcolm, right? But they gave Dr. King a holiday. That's how wicked 
these people really are. So with that being said, I don't want to continue to belabor the point. I believe I made my point very well. Right? 56 years later, where are we? Why is it that the self-hatred is so astronomically high among black people? We can't even sit and break bread together. Hell, we can't even communicate on social media without fussing and fighting over some religions and we getting caught up in the so-called um, beefs with our brothers and sisters that have something and all over social media creating chaos. That's a distraction. It's really a distraction. And then on top of that, they're doing the job for our open enemy, where the open enemy doesn't have to even worry about doing the job anymore. We're doing the job. We're destroying each other out of pure ignorance. Some of us don't even have a justifiable reason. There's a certain lifestyle we adapted and we'll do anything to maintain that lifestyle until Almighty God Allah snatched the breath out of our bodies. See? I'm look, I'm not trying to sit here and act like I'm picture perfect or I'll be damned if I sit here and spill my guts about my life. We all struggling for balance. There's none of us perfect. I mean, I do this out of love here. And nobody paid me. I don't get no um, bars or brackets for anything like that. I'm just inspired to share. And I was following Dr. King's videos over the last few days, just watching them and sucking up everything that he was sharing. But I've been doing this for years, studying Dr. King. It's sad that man went the way he went. It wasn't just the gunshot he took. It was them crackers that was in that operating room. That's why when you have family in the hospital or in the jails, you can't abandon them, man. You got to go and be right by their side and force them people to tell you everything that's going on or they'll do whatever they want to your family. That's what they do. They experiment on us when we go to the hospital and the jails. They don't have a clue on how to fix this or that. They just run testers and they give you this and give you that. It's like rats. Just to see if it works. And if it works, you stay alive a little longer. And if it doesn't, you die. They, they know how to clean up their mess. But Dr. King was murdered in the hospital. Right? What do we get out of that, family? We have to really take a step back and learn from all of this stuff and stop repeating it. I'll be dead and gone in years, if not sooner. I really don't know. What am I leaving my children? A pipe dream about being a millionaire? Money ain't going with you. You came in here with nothing, you gonna leave with nothing. And whatever you have, you'll leave it with whoever is behind you when you're gone. The dream that Dr. King had was for us to be free and have the alien rights as human beings on this planet to live equally among all men. That's why in this uh, final call, back of the paper, what the Muslims want and believe, the most honorable Muhammad said, we want freedom, justice, and equality for all humans, human families of the planet, for all. Go read it. He didn't say just for black people or just for the Nation of Islam members. He said for all. And the duty of a civilized person as taught by the Havilah Muhammad is to civilize the human family of the planet Earth. He didn't just say for the Nation of Islam or black people. He said the human family. We so misunderstood the most honorable Muhammad, and we definitely don't truly understand the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. We're so much scientists in our own right that we fall short the glory of God just because we won't humble ourselves and listen. I thank Almighty God Allah for our dear brother, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. This man started from childhood, really from birth. And he went the distance till he lost his life. 
believing that someday we will get justice in this uh, country called America. But the reality is we will never receive justice because can't nobody give you justice. Justice is for the taking. And we're not talking violently and, and no. Justice is for the taking. We must unify. Black people can unify. It was proven in 1995 during the Million Man March. Over two million black men was present. Even white men was in the crowd. Peace and harmony, love exhibited. So don't tell me black people can't get together and unite. We could if we choose to. And as long as we choose not to, it is what it is. Thank you for listening. I leave you as I came before you. In the nation, be the words of peace and paradise. Assalamu alaikum.